His time, in His time, He makes all things beautiful, in His time, Lord, please show me every day, as You're teaching me Your way, that You do just what you say in your time, in your time, in your time, you make all things beautiful in your time. Lord, my life to you I bring. May each song I have to sing be to you a lovely thing in your time. Good morning, trendsetters, and uh, welcome to our next video version. Um, as many of you know that uh, uh, Debbie and I are going to be doing some traveling through the summer months, and so... Um, we're not going to meet in person again until after, uh, after Labor Day. We'll, uh, we'll get back together in person. In the meantime, over the coming weeks, uh, we will uh, put online, uh, continue uh, studies in, in, in First Timothy. And uh, you can look for those in, uh, on our Calvary Visalia YouTube channel on the uh, second and fourth Thursdays of the month, same as our meeting dates. And you'll get the latest um, lesson, <laughs> excuse me, um, as we continue through our studies. So I uh, wanted to keep that going, just not sure what our schedule was going to be and everyone's availability and and the videos that, uh, for those of you that, that use them, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, pretty handy and to be able just to go to the uh, YouTube site and uh, take a look at the video and, and keep up with our studies. So enough with that. You know, we're going to continue here. We started uh, chapter five in First Timothy a few weeks ago in our in-person uh, studies. And, and you know, First Timothy is, is uh, you know, the first of two letters that uh, Paul wrote to his young protege, uh, young pastor uh, Timothy, giving him some advice and, and addressing some issues that had come up within the church that Paul had heard about. And and, and basically, this is the, you know, this is kind of the, um, with, with Paul being the, 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 the master teacher and, and so forth, just bringing along uh, this young pastor and giving him really good insights into the structure of the church and uh, how to treat people and so forth. In fact, um, you know, in our last time we were together, uh, we spent some time looking at, uh, you know, Paul had spent some time about, you know, building the church and who, you know, is qualified to be leaders and, and kind of put that structure together and uh, reminding him what he was there for, what his purpose was of preaching, you know, and, and, and teaching, you know, regarding, you know, salvation. And he gets into some of the practical details and, and uh, you know, he started out uh, chapter five with, you know, it, it treat people within their, you know, their age groups and so forth. And, and you're kind of a young man, but, you know, as you address the older members, then you need to keep that in mind as you deal with them respectfully and, and, and so forth. And then he also went into really great detail regarding widows and a church's responsibility to see that their needs are being met. Now, the next group that, that Paul addresses are, are the elders. And, and when I say elders, uh, we're talking, and in, in, you know, he's talking in this instance, those who are called, you know, to tend the sheep and, and, and lead their congregations. You know, as we study the New Testament, we find that the pattern laid out for church leadership is not a system of personnel committees and elections and influential families and hierarchies, but it's very simply, it's simply a group of men known as elders who study and seek to follow God's word. Now, we know that not all elders are, are gifted to teach, but the common denominator here is that 
they have a strong desire to seek God's will for his people through the study of his word and communion with our creator through prayer and supplication. You know, one of the challenges of, of church life is authority within the church, especially here in America. There's been so much in the headlines recently of, you know, things that are going on within the church that are leadership issues. Um, and, uh, it, and those things really cast into doubt, right? And make it really difficult, really, to allow ourselves to submit to the God-given authority of, of church leadership. Now, as parents, we can certainly relate to authority issues when it comes to our kids, especially those in their teens. One teenager recently blogged, said, Today, my mom screeched at me about my pillowcase being dirty and finished off one long rant with an irate, Who raised you to be such a pig? Her anger multiplied by 10 when I asked if it was a trick question. <laughs> Uh, authority issues, right, are really a rough spot in, in, in most churches. And I don't think ours has been no exception yet. You know, God has ordained a very simple structure for church leadership. Let's go to our text for today. This is 1 Timothy chapter 5, starting in verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder, except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning Rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've given us, given us this, this technology, this avenue to continue our studies in your word together. Father, we pray that you, you bless these next few moments as we as we dive into to what your apostle paul uh, had to say to, to timothy lord open our hearts open our minds to, to your word today we love you in jesus name we pray amen amen so we're starting this this section and it's really about treating elders um and it you know, and, and he's really telling us elders are to be honored according to principles from Scripture. Let's read this again. Verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the Scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worth his wages. So, I just want to be clear here as we as we talk about elders uh, this morning, uh, you know, we, we're talking about it really a broad sense, and it's it really addresses those in leadership within a church, and and this and the focus here is on those elders who rule and elders who teach, and you know as I said earlier, not necessarily will every elder who rules will also be one that can teach. That's a, one of the aspects of being an elder is having the ability to teach. But there is, as we know, people have different gifts and so forth. And, and there are some that are really gifted in that manner. And Paul says, be counted worthy of double honor. And so he's saying here that, that if an elder, like our pastor and so forth, rules well and labors in the word and doctrine, clearly speaking, right, that he's working hard at it, that 
it's worthy of double honor. And, and in this context, it really means financial support. You know, Paul already told us earlier in the chapter that certain widows are worthy of honor. And, and, and again, he's speaking of financial support. But then he goes on to say, right, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, there's many that think that the, the church shouldn't support the staff and that paid uh, ministry is an abomination. They say that the church instead should be using that money to support the needy. You know, that's a, I guess you might think of it as an attractive way of thinking, but it really isn't biblical. If the needy, that is the truly needy, are worthy of honor, then those who rule and teach in the church are worthy of double honor. And and he's not saying that, you know, that you should be, you know, paying the, you know, the you know, pastor, you know, twice what or whatever. You know, we you can get into those kind of crazy arguments. And what he's really saying here is and and, and he's pulling it actually you know, from, from scripture, Deuteronomy 25, four is, is a reference about the oxen and, and Luke 10, seven is, is about those who labor that, you know, from Jesus word. And then also, you know, over in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, uh, we, we are exhorted in this manner. It says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable uh, for you. Now, you know, here in, in America, especially, you know, we really push back about these, you know, obey those who rule and, and be submissive and so forth. And, you know, it's a, we've seen so much abuse of power in the political arena and, and, you know, even in the corporate arenas and so forth that, yeah, we have a real hard time with thinking about being submissive to rulers and, and so forth. But, but those that are called to lead and, and pastor our congregations, these are a special calling from God. And these leaders are, have a higher level of accountability to our creator for the work that they do. And so that those who are put in place to, to, to lead our congregations and so forth, that we're to submit to them because they're coming to us from God's holy word and God's direction for his people. And, um, and, and that's really what it gets down to. And if, if you know, being submissive to church leadership is really being submissive to God, you know, that, that leader is, is God's agent. Now, let's go on uh, at, at verse 19. It says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. So he says, Do not receive. So, Paul is, 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 is going after this business of, you know, the, oh, the, the um, back talking and, and, and those kinds of things that, that go on within any groups of people and gossip and so forth. And, and, um, and it really comes about for, for those, uh, you know, that are in leadership uh, that may be teaching or they may be adhering to principles that run counter to our culture, um, and, and they may not be real easy things to listen to, and that can really get the chirpies going, and um, um, and, and and that's a problem, right? It's a problem. It's a problem with the murmuring and the gossiping and those kind of things that go on, and and it's also if you know it's also true, you know, leaders will fall into sin, and they need to be held. To account to that, and and actually, one of the commentators that that I read through said this. He said, "Nothing does more harm than when some people are treated as if they could do no wrong, and others if they could do no right." And and that's kind of what the gist of where Paul is going. He says, "Don't receive an accusation except from two or three witnesses. Any accusation, you know, that's made." against the leader 
shouldn't be automatically received. It should be really carefully verified by two or three witnesses, not just two or three others who also heard the gossip, but true witnesses to, to whatever has taken place. And, 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 and Paul has advised Timothy, you can't allow these false accusations you know, to circulate. John Calvin um, told us this in his teachings. It is indeed a trick of Satan to estrange men from their ministers so as gradually to bring their teaching into contempt. In this way, not only is wrong done to innocent people whose reputation is undeservedly injured, but the authority of God's holy teaching is diminished. You know, this is just you know, gossip and innuendo and 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 outright lies, right? That get spread around through the rumor mills and, and so forth. Those are absolutely tools of the enemy to bring down the church and to, to stop, you know, the good news from being spread, you know, among the people. <laughs> Here's an old story about a pastor that was trying to defend himself against criticism. He said this, there's a story going about that I told my wife not to go to a certain church that has wild meetings. They say my wife went anyway, and I dragged her out of that church by her hair and hurt her so badly she had to go to the hospital. First of all, I never told her to stay away from that church. Second, I didn't drag her out by her hair. Third, she never had to go to the hospital. And lastly, I've never been married, so I don't have a wife, right? I, you know, that's a kind of a silly story, but I think we can all relate on how, you know, some of these things can go. Um, you know, I can't, you know, it's hard for me to you know, do a lesson also without some Spurgeon quotes. And, and here's a something that, that Spurgeon advised uh, to his students that when people come to a pastor with gossip, here's what they should say. Well, all this is very important. I need to give it my full attention. But my memory isn't so good, and I have a lot to think about. Can you write it all down for me? Now, Spurgeon says this to take care of it because they don't want to write down their gossip. Isn't that the truth? So when you hear these things, test it a bit. And the first question is, did you actually see whatever it is take place? And if they can't say yes, and you say, we're done. I don't need to hear the rest of this. And you get, but, 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 so-and-so told me. No, that doesn't make it. That's not the way God has ordained for us to deal with these issues. When we hear from witnesses that are actual witnesses of an event, then, yeah, we need to move forward with, with taking the appropriate action. But is people pronounce these kinds of things and bring them to us, we're just, stop it. I don't need to hear it. I don't want to, you know, it, it, the only reason to listen to it is just for your own prurient kind of interest, to, to pique your own curiosity over what's the latest gossip. And we're not called to be that way. We need to set ourselves apart and conduct ourselves much differently. Now, Paul goes on to say, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear. And this is the other side of it, right? If a leader is in sin, it must be addressed publicly with a public rebuke. And that's to promote, promote really fear of sin amongst the leadership and the entire church. So many churches have had great trouble because of sin and leadership that was not dealt with, you know, forthrightly. And it's important that everyone understand leadership in a church doesn't shield someone from accountability. It makes one even more accountable. You go back to the Middle Ages, right? The church protected the corrupt bishops against accusation by demanding that 72 witnesses be brought forth to confirm any accusation against the bishop. <laughs> and we see where that's led, right? You know, how many times over the, you know, the, in, in the recent past, you know, we keep finding, you know, where these accusations have been made and, and they were real issues that were going on within the church. And, and so the uh, 
priests or pastors that get transferred to different areas and moved out of the location. And a lot of uh, effort gone into keeping these things under wrap. Big blow up at the Southern Baptist Convention here a few months ago. Same kinds of things. There was all kinds of abuse going on within some of the ministry leadership. And there was a huge effort to cover those things up. And we're not called to do that. God says, call it out. Those who are sinning, they get rebuked in the presence of all, and it needs to be brought to public. You know, we we allow our emotions to guide. Oh, we don't want to embarrass so-and-so, or his family is going to... You know, those are the consequences of sin. And, uh, and, and the only way it can be really dealt with properly is, is to do as we're directed here in God's Word. Now, Paul goes on also in, in verse 21, he says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. This is a strong statement, right, folks? And, and it's really meant to, you know, show the seriousness of the job that leaders in the church have. They serve an eternal God, and they have to please him first in everything that they do. And, you know, it's, again, I go back to John Calvin. He says he adds to Christ the angels, not that they're judges, but as future witnesses of carelessness or rashness or self-seeking or bad faith. They are present as spectators, they have been given charge to care for the church. So this is that higher plane of accountability that I talked about a little bit ago that church leaders are on. And they are responsible for, responsible for our eternal God, our eternal creator. And it's God and his angels are watching all that we do. And so as leaders in the church, we need to work just as diligently as we can to lead holy and faithful lives that are beyond rebuke. Paul goes on to say, observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. You know, prejudice and partiality, these are, uh, these are grave sins before God. Uh, you know, James talks about it in, in, in chapter two. And, uh, and this goes on even, it's, uh, it's not only class, but gender and race and all of these things. If, if we are treating folks different because of those things, then we're in sin. Galatians 3.26 says this, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say, uh, except you, you, know, you, you, got, you, you white guys with European ancestry, you get treated differently than than, than uh, you brown people from Mexico. No, we are all one in Christ Jesus. We were all created in God's image. And it's through the wonders of his creation that he introduced this vast diversity in who we all are. But we are all sons of God through our faith in Christ Jesus. Amen to that. Verse 22. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Now, what he's kind of getting to here is, is, is really about those that are being brought into the ministry. Laying on of hands was, is part of, the, uh, um, 
part of the, the, the ritual of, of bringing someone into the ministry. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty usual to, you know, someone stepping up, coming into a kind of a leadership position within a church that, you know, elders and others will gather around and lay hands on them and, and pray and, and welcome them into the leadership business and so forth. And, and, and Tim, I mean, Paul here is, is telling Timothy, don't be in a hurry to do that. Um, and some think that, that you know, this context is, is about uh, uh, those that, uh, you know, may have, you know, sinned and gone against the church and, and, and has to do with don't be hasty about allowing them back into fellowship of the church um, and so forth. Uh, but Paul might be talking something about that. There was, I guess, in the early church circles, uh, those that had fallen into some scandalous sin had to be received back into the church with a laying on of hands and prayer by, by church leaders. And uh, nonetheless, Paul is saying, just don't go too fast here. Let them demonstrate their repentance first. And if he's talking about those that are in, in the leadership, you know, someone that 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 comes to Jesus Christ, declares his faith in him, man, they are on fire. They are ready to go do all kinds of things. Just all, some is immediately after they've uh, they've accepted the Lord in their life. They're not yet ready for leadership. Uh, they've got some growing to do uh, and, and so forth. And so just because we have willing participants doesn't necessarily mean that they're really ready to, to, to get into, go into service. Um, the, the flip side of it also is, you know, uh, you know, if somebody, you know, uh, waits too long, right, to get into service, uh, or if, you know, they don't want to go until they've been recognized with a title or so forth, uh, that kind of tells you that maybe they're more interested in, in an image, they, they want the title and so forth. Uh, but they don't have, you know, the substance that's there to be in in, in uh, leadership in a church. Paul also advises Timothy, keep yourself pure. And so it kind of gets back to actually Paul has hit this subject a couple of times with, with Timothy. You know, what people see you do says way more than any of the words that you might speak. And so he said, Timothy, just be careful in how you live, where you go, the things that you do, uh, and so forth. Because, you know, it's really up to you to observe and assess the lives of others. And so if you've got some crazy stuff going on, you know, that you think are hidden and out of sight, nah, those things will come to bear. And so you need to work at keeping yourself pure. And uh, also says, don't share in other people's sins. Yeah. <laughs> We all have enough sin of our own. We don't need to add to it by, you know, partaking in the sins of others. And, and you may, well, how do I do that? Well, we can share in the sins of others by setting a bad example before them. Or we can share in the sins of others by approving of them or ignoring them. Or we can share um, in the sins of others by you know, joining a church that spreads dangerous teachings. You know, it gets back to this theme of we are all one in Christ Jesus. And we all have to answer to the same authority. And, um, and you know, we're told to test the spirits, we're to be watchful and, and all those kinds of things. And, and that's part of, you know, keeping our lives pure. We need to stay away from, uh, you know, the things that are not good for us and, uh, and, and walk in the light of Jesus' word. Now, here's one that, that uh, uh, you know, verse 23. And, and so this is Paul giving some medical advice to Timothy. He says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Use a little wine. Now, let, let's set this in the right context. You know, water in the ancient world was often impure and had some problems with it. And perhaps Timothy was having some problems with, with that bad water. 
And, you know, since the fermentation process can eliminate some of the harmful things in the water, it'd be better for him to drink a little wine rather than water all the time, is kind of what he says. He, he tells him, use a little wine. Now, you know, we can also suppose here, Timothy was probably abstaining from alcohol for, the, for setting a good example. And however, right, this abstinence was, was hurting his, his health. Wine really was safer to drink than water. So Paul's telling Timothy, it's not wise to sacrifice his health for the sake of this abstinence. He'll do more good for the Lord by taking care of his body in this circumstance. Now, he's not saying go out and just pour it on Timothy. He's telling him, Timothy, you got to take care of your, your body. You know, this is the Lord's temple. This is the vessel that... That, that God wants to use to reach his people, and it's on you to care for it. And and it's okay, you know, for you to do uh, this thing with the wine because we, we know what's going on. Just, he says, use a little. So it's, be careful with this. The more important thing here is take care of your frequent infirmities. Now, it, it's also kind of interesting here, at, you know, from reading... Uh, in, the, in, in, in Acts chapter 19, you know, there's, a, uh, you know, Paul sending a, you know, a handkerchief with a healing power. He didn't do that with Timothy. And whether he could or not at that time, I'm not sure. Uh, but, you know, really the, the miracles that, that the apostles performed and so forth uh, were really only at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And apparently, you know, in Timothy's case, that, that's not what Paul was prompted to do. He was just give him some sage human advice on, on uh, taking care of himself. Verse 24. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. You know, simply saying, right, it's easy to see the struggles and the sins that some have, but with others, they're hidden away. Now, if we think about it, I'm sure that we can all think through that we're, there's areas of our lives that God is dealing with. You know, sometimes it's clearly evident to others, but more times than not, it's not. And the other side of this as well is that some people are regarded holy just because they're good at hiding their sin. He also says, otherwise cannot be hidden. Good works are always eventually revealed, but sins are sometimes hidden, and some will be evident only at the judgment. And why is Paul telling Timothy this? It's really, it's to be cautious over who it is that you appoint in the positions of leadership. Sometimes what we see on the outside isn't really an accurate picture. So we need to take it slow. We need to wait on God for discernment and, uh, you know, be careful in, in who we choose. You know, it's true, isn't it, that, that we're always in danger of drifting, right, with our worldly culture rather than confronting things with, with God's truth. Think about the, you know, the theme, right, of our culture is tolerance of anything except someone who's not tolerant. It's affected the American church in so many ways, primarily, right, in the watering down of God's holy word skipping over or reinterpreting passages that don't support today's culture. The desire to fit in with society overrides standing for God's truth. Elders are held to a higher, higher level of accountability because God is jealous for his children. The Bible is very clear that elders are not only to exhort in sound doctrine, but also to refute those who contradict. Read about that in Titus 1, 9. 
But the mood of our day is that we can't criticize or judge anyone, no matter how far out of line they are, because that implies we're right and they're wrong. And that doesn't fit with the supreme virtue of tolerance. During the time of the Reformation, many Catholic priests had mistresses and illegitimate children. Many of them were greedily misusing church funds to live in luxury. A major distinctive of the Reformed churches was a return to church discipline. They sought to hold their pastors and members accountable to the holy standards of God's word. God greatly honored that return to righteousness among his people. Although you get accused of being hateful when you confront sin and call people to holiness, and though some do it wrongly because they lack compassion, it's not hate, but it's the love of God that confronts sin and false doctrine. Sin and teaching contrary to God's word destroys people. Holiness and sound doctrine save people from God's judgment and build them in the joy of our Lord. Our God is holy. We, his people, and especially we who are church leaders, must be holy ourselves in all our behavior. God's word to all of this from these verses is simply this. Keep yourself pure from sin. Amen. Amen. Next time, we'll get started in chapter 6. God bless you.